words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Thank you, F. It is great to be here with you to talk about scripture and formation. And as an Old Testament professor, the main point I want to communicate to you this afternoon is if you want to know Jesus and if you want to experience life with Jesus, read the Old Testament. And uh, perhaps I'm speaking to the converted already, but if you're a typical Christian crowd, no matter how devout you are, my sense is that you're probably not steady students of the Old Testament, and I want to give you a reason why you should be, as people are interested in spiritual formation. Indeed, just this past week, some of you probably heard that there was a prominent pastor whose name I won't say, Andy Stanley, <laughs> who has called on Christians to unhitch themselves from the Old Testament. Why? I assume it's because it's an Old Testament and it's hard to understand, hard to see how it's relevant, and there are some troubling things to us living in the 21st century West in the Old Testament. So why not just unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament? Well, let me begin by telling you about going to the movies with my father. When I was young, I loved being with my father. He traveled a lot, and when he was home, it was wonderful to be with him, but I hated going to the movies with him. Why? Because he never felt it was necessary to see when the movie started. We would just go to the movies, and I remember one James Bond movie early on, going to the movie and arriving 15 minutes before the end. And then we'd stay and watch the end, and then we'd wait during the intermission, and we'd watch the beginning, and then he'd say, well, this is where we came in. Now, I would submit to you that at least that first part, which is to uh, come in 15 minutes before the end of a really dramatic movie and watching it, is something like reading only the New Testament and not the Old Testament. Why? Because the New Testament is grounded in the Old Testament and tells us the story of creation and the introduction of sin and death and God's acts of redemption toward us and uh, gives us that grand narrative, plus more, as we'll see. But what I want to say especially is not just that the New Testament really makes no sense without the Old Testament, but that Jesus himself told us that he wanted us to be students of the Old Testament. Why? Because the entire Old Testament anticipated his coming. This is Luke 24. Luke 24, Jesus is walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and, and they're upset. And Jesus asks, why are you so upset? God has kept them from recognizing who they are. And they say, you haven't heard what just happened. Our great leader in whom we put so much hope just died in Jerusalem. And you'll remember what Jesus said to them. He said, how foolish you are. And then he said, the law and the prophets, all the scriptures spoke of my coming. And then a little bit later in the chapter, uh, Jesus says the same thing, that all the scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, all anticipated his coming. So you see, Jesus was a professor of hermeneutics, or Bible interpretation, to the Christian church, and we don't listen to him. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to experience life with Jesus, read the Old Testament. The Old Testament shapes our lives. The Old Testament reminds us of all that Jesus has done for us. And I could choose any of a hundred, a thousand uh, different illustrations. And indeed, I just changed my mind as to what I'm going to share. <laughs> I figure, uh, how much time do I have left? About 10, 11 minutes? 
Let's do the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> the whole book, okay? So, just to remind you about the book of Ecclesiastes, and you really, I mean, one of the reasons why people avoid the Old Testament is that it is distant from us. It is difficult for us to understand. But anything worthwhile is worth, you know, working on. For those of us who are willing to fast for heaven's sakes, it ought to encourage us to put effort into studying. Because, you see, and here's a point that I think is important to remember, and you're not going to like this when I first say this. The Bible was not written to you. There's no book of the Bible that was written to you. They didn't call the book of Romans Romans for nothing. Why? Because it wrote, it's a letter written to the church at Rome. We get to look at it, read it, and we need to study what it was communicating to those people at that particular moment and then ask, how does that relate to us today? And we do that with the Old Testament too, only it's much more distant from us. But briefly, let me talk about the book of Ecclesiastes as an example of a book that can form us and also that brings us into contact with Jesus. Let me start by saying that John Calvin told us, and I think you will all relate to this, that the human mind, and he's including Christians here, are factories of idols. That we're constantly warring to keep Jesus on the throne in first place and not let other things come in place of Jesus. So what's the book of Ecclesiastes about? Well, when you study it, you see there are two speakers in the book. There is a man who in Hebrew is referred to as Kohelet, which means uh, the assembler, but we usually translate it the teacher or the preacher. And then there's a second wise man at the end who's talking to his son about the teacher and evaluating what the teacher's saying. So what's the message? And you'll have to read through it to see that I'm, I'm not going to be proof texting my points here. But what's the message of the teacher? Well, as I used to put it to my uh, Westmont undergraduates, the message of the teacher is life sucks and then you die. Okay. <laughs> life sucks and then you die. So. Uh, you'll remember that the teacher is looking for the meaning of life, and he's looking in all these different areas. And he's saying, uh, is there meaning in my work? And the answer is no, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Is there meaning in pleasure? No. Is there meaning in wisdom? No. Is there meaning in relationships? No. Uh, is there meaning in money? No. So what does the second wise man say? Because the teacher has concluded that all these things are meaningless. Why? Because of death. You can have all the money in the world, but you're going to die, and then a fool's going to inherit it. Uh, it's meaningless because there's injustice in this world. Um, and there's meaninglessness because even though God has made everything according to its proper time, he hasn't let us in on it. So it's a pretty depressing portrait that the teacher paints for us. But then the second wise man come in, comes in and he says to his son, and of course I'm paraphrasing here, he says, you know son, the teacher is 100% correct. Life is difficult. And then you die. As long as you adopt the perspective of the teacher, which is to look for meaning under the sun. You'll remember that that phrase occurs a lot throughout the teacher's reflections. Son, you're not going to find meaning under the sun. So what does the father tell his son in the last two verses? He says, fear God, son, obey the commandments and live in the light of the future judgment. What, there's a lot we could say about this, because I think the father's not just 
uh, talking about these three points, which are pretty significant anyway. Fear God, establish a right relationship with God that shows that you understand your place in the universe, obey his commandments, and live in the light of the judgment. It's kind of like justification, sanctification, and eschatology in a verse and a half. But he's also alluding, because the Ecclesiastes is one of the last books written, uh, and it's alluding to the three-part Hebrew canon. I make this argument elsewhere. <laughs> so it's basically saying, don't live under the sun. Live in the light of God's revelation. Put God first. You see, the book of Ecclesiastes is an idol buster. It's busting the idols that we all make. Uh, we may make money an idol. We may make wealth an idol. We make, may, may make ministry an idol. We may make it a relationship an idol. And the book of Ecclesiastes is saying, if you don't put God first, those things are all going to let you down. Now, how do you read a book like Ecclesiastes in the light of the New Testament? How does this point us to Christ? Well, there's one place in the New Testament that alludes to the book of Ecclesiastes, and that's Romans 8:18 8, and following. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed for the creation was subjected to frustration. This word frustration in Greek is the same word, is the word that's used in Greek translations of the Old Testament for meaninglessness or hevel, hevel, which is translated meaningless. So it's saying, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Now what's that referring to? Well, it's referring to Genesis 3, that because of human sin, God subjected the world to frustration, which reminds us that as the teacher's looking for meaning under the sun, he's trying to find it in a fallen world, and of course he's going to come up empty. But Paul, that's where the teacher stops. Paul goes further. He says, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. He's pointing to the gospel. He's pointing to Jesus. He's saying Jesus subjected himself to a fallen world. Uh, Jesus, who Philippians 2 reminds us, was, you know, God emptied himself, and he came and he lived in the fallen world. He suffered as we suffer, and he died on our behalf. The point is that Jesus, the message of the New Testament is that Jesus came and endured the hevel of the meaningless world like the teacher or us couldn't even imagine it. When Jesus is hanging on the cross after the crowds deserted him, after the disciples deserted him, Peter denied him, Judas betrayed him. Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I'm not appealing here to some crass kind of penal substitutionary atonement. I think the Father himself is doing this out of love for us and that it deeply pains him. We shouldn't paint a picture of an angry God who is, take, who is taking out his wrath in some kind of arbitrary way on the sun. But the point is that God does this so that Jesus could experience the meaninglessness that Kohelet and all of us struggle with in order to defeat death, which you'll remember is the thing that most disturbed the teacher, and he rises in victory in the resurrection. So when you read the book of Ecclesiastes in the light of the New Testament, it reminds you of this great thing that Jesus has done for us. So, if you want to know Jesus, if you want to experience life with Jesus, read the Old Testament. Thank you.